Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. You know, that's we're going to go a little bit over that later on, but I just wanted to set the tone for the lesson for this evening, and, and we hear this a lot, and we also sing about this a lot, and it's abide, and what does it mean to abide in something? What does it mean to abide in Christ? And that's who we just read about. So let's look at what does abiding in Christ mean? So what we're going to look at is, is what does it mean and what do we have to do as Christians? So the first thing we got to think about is Christ lives in us. In Galatians, in the first, in the New Testament, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it states, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, we should have that same mindset when it comes to that. When we read Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, right, it talks about being crucified with Christ. We all know how Christ was crucified and what did he do in order for that to happen, what that gave us. It, also, it gave us hope, so what does that mean for us? And this is big about when we get baptized as well, right? When we get baptized, what happens with us? We are buried, just like Christ was. We raise up, just like he did. Sin should be washed away with a new creature coming out. We're reborn. And what happens when we're reborn? We put those sins away and live that life like we should as children of God. We should have that same mindset as we see in Galatians 2, verse 20. We are a new creature in Him in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. You know, it has a lot of similarities there in verse 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Same thing. Right? When we're buried, we come up. We are a new creature. We are created a new being. So that's what abiding in Christ means. It means Christ lives in us. So if Christ lives in us, that means we need to live like Him. Right? We see that the way that Jesus was, and obviously we know that we can't do a lot of things that He did. Right? He was perfect. We know that we're imperfect. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive every single day to live just like He did. To teach just like He did. To learn and take everything in just like he did. Christ lives in us and we are a new creature in him, in Christ. Abiding in Christ also means that we walk in him. Right? We know that every day we walk a life and, and in our lives that we walk every day, we all go through different paths. What we need to realize in Colossians 2, verse 6, is the path we should be walking. So in Colossians 2, verse 6, it states, Therefore, as you receive Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk in Him. We need to realize who we receive first. And we need to walk and do what Christ did. And it talks about how we are also in His body, who He is the head of. And we are in his body, and what does that even mean? 
So let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 through 23, and see that. Ephesians 1, 22. <clears throat> and it says, And he put all things under his feet, and gave them as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. So when we abide in Christ, it means we are in his body. Right? He is the head of it, and we need to do exactly what he did on this earth, which means teach and follow and set the example that he set as well. So let's continue this for a little bit. We're also in his kingdom, and we read that. That was our scripture reading for this evening. We are in his kingdom. That kingdom was given to him, and he earned it. He earned that kingdom from what he did. He not only lived that perfect life, but he was also willing to be that sacrifice. He bought it with his blood. And so it's his kingdom, and we are in his kingdom. We are in his family, his fold. Just real quick, I'm going to glance over at Romans chapter 8, verse 17. You know, the next verse in this, and it states in verse 17 of Romans chapter 8. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs of Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. You know, <clears throat> have you ever suffered for Christ? You know, you don't have to... You don't have to raise your hand or anything, but I, I'm sure all of us at some point have suffered because of our faith. Right? Because not everybody agrees with it. And so sometimes we've seen those hardships, and we're not the only ones. Christ also had to suffer for his faith. You know, we, we see that in his death. He ultimately died for it. Which means he was that perfect being, and he still died because of his faith. Because of who he was and how much hope he wanted to give us. So if we are children of God, obviously we're going to go through the same thing. But that's what we do. We're his children. We're his family. So what does family do? They stick up for one another. Right? We don't forget where we came from. Where we came from is God. And what that means is that we have to abide in him. Abide in Christ and follow His commands. We're also united together when we abide in Christ. Let's go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, verses 20 through 21. John 17, 20 through 21. And Jesus is talking here. And it says, I do not ask for these things only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. We're all supposed to be united, and does it feel like we're all united at times? Because it seems like, you know, you go out and read the news, you know, you see on social media, there's a lot of division. That's not how it's supposed to be. Right? We see that in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 21. We are to be united together. Right? We are all supposed to be family. We're all supposed to be sticking together. And we all are supposed to be having the same goal. We need to be united. Which means if we abide in Christ and we do it the right way... It means we should never be alone. Not only do we have God with us, not only do we have Jesus with us, but we should be united with others who are also children of God. And together, we maintain that unity. Let's go to Ephesians. Let's see what Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 says about that. <clears throat> Together we maintain that unity. And let's see that in Ephesians 4, verse 1. It says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. 
eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So how do we maintain that unity together? What are some of the things that we need in order for that to happen? So we have all been called. You know, we all were given the hope, so what are we supposed to do as Christians? We have to walk with humility. We have to have, we have to walk in a manner worthy of that. Right? We all know that because of what Jesus did, you know, we aren't worthy of that because we're all sinners. We get that. But we got lucky because we have that love that he should. We have the love from God. We have the love from Christ. And with that, since they loved us so much, we need to walk worthy of that. So to abide in Christ is to live for Him, which means we have to give everything to Him. So how do we live for Him? We do it by a walk of faith. And, and these mention the same thing. That's why I'm going to skip to Romans chapter 1. If you would, let's go there. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. Romans 1, 16 through 17. And let's see about living by faith and not by sight. Romans 1, 16 through 17. It states, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God, for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. We have to live by faith. That's, that, that's what we see in this text. That's what we're commanded to do. We have to live by faith, not by sight. And obviously, if we're going to be abiding in Christ, that means we have to serve Him with all of our hearts. Right? And in order for that to happen, we have to give it our all. You know, and that, that's what shows when we give that effort, it shows how much we love Him. We also have to serve Him with fervency of spirit. Let's go to Romans chapter 12, verses 11. Romans 12, verse 11. <clears throat> States Romans 12, verse 11. It says, Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. So what does it mean to not be slothful in zeal? So, when you talk about zeal, you talk about pouring it out. Right? You're talking about giving effort. And slothful means lazy. So if I'm a coach and I have players who are being lazy, whether on the field or in practice, Right? That's not acceptable. I have to have everybody giving me everything in order for us to be successful. I need everybody to buy into that. I need everybody on the same page, which means they have to work hard in order to be successful. Well, there's no difference in our faith right here. When we abide in Christ, we have to serve Him with everything. And if we're doing it in a lazy way, that means we're not giving all to Him. That means we're not giving the effort that we need to give. Right? In order to be successful Christians, in order to abide in Christ, we have to give them everything. We have to serve Him with everything. You know, He, he gave us hope. He gave us everything. Why can't we give them everything? So let's continue this a little bit more. We walk in the light in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. We have to walk in that light that we're provided and live worthy of our calling in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, which we read earlier. You know, we've all been called. We've all been called to serve Him and follow Him and obey all of His commandments. So we have to live worthy to that. You know, that should be something we can be thankful for. That's a huge blessing to us. So why not live worthy to it? Why not give Him everything? And we also have to obey all His commandments. Let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 6.
In Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, it says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God. Oh, I'm in the wrong one. I'm in John. Let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 6. It says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Sound familiar? Right who we learned about Wednesday, it was the exact same way. Another man who was blameless was Job. And every time we see blameless in the sight of the Lord, obviously it's a good thing. So what did these people do? What, what, what did Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth do? They were both righteous before the Lord, walking blamelessly in all the commandments. Right? And, and we talked about being slothful and being lazy. Right? An example of that would just to be maybe to obey some. You know, I'm going to obey some of these because they're, they're a little bit easier than the other ones. We ever found ourselves doing that because... You know, I hate to say it, but in the past, I might have done that a few times. Right? Maybe not just in Scripture, but maybe somewhere in life. You know, you, you do the easy things, and, and you push the hard things to the side, and sometimes that's not what we're supposed to do. In order for us to give everything, in order for us to give all the efforts, we have to obey all the commandments. You know, these... You know, both him and his wife were both blameless and they were both pleasing in the sight of the Lord because they were willing to do that. Which means it's not impossible. It's not impossible to be blameless and to be following all of what God commands us. Because we've seen so many times He's not going to give us anything that's too hard for us. So which means that if He has given us a specific amount of commands... He knows we can fall. So to abide in Christ demands we work for Him. So what, what do we need to do? Obedience is absolutely required. You know, without reading Ecclesiastes, we know that. We, I had a lesson a few months ago on obedience in here alone. And we know that in order for us to be good servants of God, we have to be obedient to him. We have to obey all of his commands. We have to abound the work of the Lord. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15 or 58 and see what that tells us. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, which states, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. You know, we're, there's always something that we can do. There's always someone we can teach. You know, the work is never done. We always read the scripture from Revelation 2.10 to be faithful unto death. Which means until we die, there's still always work we need to do as children of God. And it's not impossible. Jesus did it. You know, Paul did it. We see the Apostle Paul, right? He said, I finished the good race. And there might have been times where he was not perfect. We know the life that he lived before. But once he figured it out, he was always abounding in the word of the Lord. And we see the reward that he was given because of that. That same reward can be given to us. It's not impossible or else he wouldn't have given us that work to do. There's always work that needs to be done. Always zealous of good works. Let's go to Titus. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. <coughs> Titus 2, 11 through 14. It says in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, 
For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, and to purify himself a people for his own possession, who were zealous for good works. You know, we have to be zealous of good works. We have to show zeal in doing the good works of Jesus. What does that mean? It means I'm willing to go out there and I'm willing to teach you ever. It means I'm not going to back down from the Word of God. You know, it means that no matter who I see, no matter what's going on, no matter how hard it is, I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep teaching the Word of God because that's what I was called to do. You know, we as Christians should be proud of this. You know, we are given hope. Let's take advantage of it. Let's show how zealous we can be of the good works of God. Let's show others that. Let's show them how enthusiastic we can be about His Word and how we can share it. We also should be ready unto every good work. We should be ready for anything that is good in the sight of the Lord. In Titus 3, verses 1 through 2, it states to remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and show perfect courtesy toward all people. Is that always easy? Has anybody ever wronged you and it just took you everything not to say anything evil about them? <laughs> I see some people smiling, so obviously not just me. But, <clears throat> you know, sometimes that's, that it's tough. Not everything is going to be easy in life, but that doesn't mean that we can't handle it. We should be able to handle it because we know he's not going to give us anything that's too hard to handle. We should be ready unto every good work. People are going to wrong me. What I need to do is accept it and move on. Right? Keep teaching the word. And I have to be a doer of, doer of it as well. We need to be doers of the word. We need to always work. We are given specific commands. We always need to follow those and try to teach others to do the same. You know, it's... I've listened to Brian Price at Payton City for years. And, you know, sometimes he would say it, and, and, you know, very blunt about it too, because you need to be, but I can teach people things anytime I want to. But if they see me acting like something else, do you think they're going to listen? We need to not only teach others and speak of the word, but we also have to be doers of it. They need to see that we are also willing to do it and not just teach others to do it. <clears throat> you know, I can't, I can't sit up here and do the easy things and only teach people that I know who will accept the word and not be willing to go out there and teach it myself to others. You know, sometimes that's tougher, but it still has to be done. We talked about that on Wednesday night. We know what we're supposed to be doing. Is it always easy? No. Is it always necessary? Yeah. We always have to be doers of the work. So we talked about doing the hard things, so what are the blessings and the security to those in Christ? Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> it says, there is, there, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free 
in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by setting his own son in the likeness and the likeliness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we see, right, before the, before the sacrifice of Christ, you know, everything was in vain. Because we didn't have that perfect sacrifice because of the sin that man did. Once he gave us that hope, we know that condemnation can be out of the picture if we're doers of the world. Right? If we abide by his word and we teach others his word and we follow what the word says, we can avoid condemnation. We can be with him. We can have that reward that Paul talks about. We can have the same thing. You know, it, it's just one of those things. We can either have everything or we can have nothing. So which one are we going to choose this evening? You know, some of the blessings and security, we talk about walking after the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 through 25. Eternal life and hope in Titus 1, verse 2. You know, we always talk about having that hope and how important that is. Now, what are we going to do with that? You know, what are we going to do with what Christ gave us? Kept by the power of God. Let's go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 11. It says in verse 5, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and with virtue, knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your call an election, for if your practice, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's our assurance right there. That's what we need. You know, we, we see here that we can't be blind. We can't be blind to the blessings that we were given. Now what are we going to do with those? Are we going to work our whole lives to please Him? Or are we going to let Satan win? We are only given two options. But you see this. Look how good this option is. Look how good we can have it. And when we talk about having that reward of the kingdom of heaven, have you ever sat down and thought how long eternity is? You know, we, we talk about eternity, but sometimes you, know, you sit there and you're like, wow, never ending. Never ends. Forever. And ever, and it, it just keeps going. There's no end to it. And, and we think of we think of life on this earth. It seems long. It really does. But the older I get, twenty six. The older I get, the more I realize how much how much faster it goes. You know, and when you think about it, you know, it, it doesn't matter what riches or what we have on this earth. What trials, you know, whatever, whatever life we were given once we were raised, and, and no matter what happens, we know that life on earth is short. So how are we going to spend it? 
Are we going to spend it regretting for eternity what we could have done? How about the rich man in the, in the scripture who just wanted a, a drop of water because of how hot it was? Right? Everybody remember that? Just a drop of water is all he asked for. Or we can have that eternal rest, that reward forever. And we know that if we abide in Christ, nothing can separate us. Right? Let's go to Romans chapter 8. And let's see something else that, that we can see in Romans 8, verse 35 through 39. <clears throat> in verse 35, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. There's a reason I want to share this with you all. Going through this study and reading these texts, you know, no matter how down I can feel, you read some of these rewards, you read how we're not alone, and it really gives you comfort. Right? And knowing that the more we serve Him, the more we know that we can't be separated from Him. Have you ever felt closer with maybe somebody at work, like maybe a boss, or maybe a parent, or just somebody you're supposed to answer to? And you did everything they asked you to do, and how... How much stronger does that bond start to become? Right? The more you do, the more you accomplish, the more pleased that person, the more you realize, man, I'm starting to get a bond that's unbreakable. What about our bond with Christ? You know, we're given specific commands. So what does this text tell us? It tells us that we're already loved. Right? Christ already loved us and still continues to. God loves us, still continues to. So we know that no matter what happens, we are going to be loved. Which means that's not it. Build that bond by doing what is pleasing unto Him. Make that bond unbreakable. You know, until, until the day of our death, keep working for Him. Don't be lazy in what he asks us to accomplish. Work diligently. And that's, this is, these are texts that I needed. I don't know about you all, but I needed these. Because sometimes life gets in the way. Sometimes you need to know who loves you. Sometimes you need to know, no matter what trials, no matter what happens, that you're not alone. You know, sometimes it, it takes the hard things to make us realize who we need to rely on. I needed these. I needed to know that nothing can separate me from them. Nothing can separate me from Christ. Nothing can separate me from God. And no matter what we go through in life, we can always look back on this and think, the more I do for them, the stronger I can build that bond, and the more I know that I'm not alone. And I've got to ask you all the same thing. Do you feel that way? Do you feel that way when you pray to Him? Do you feel that connection starting to get stronger? Do you feel that way when you teach others about His Word? Because I can tell you, every time I get up in here and, and speak to everybody in this building, it makes me feel like I have a stronger bond with Him. Because I'm doing one of the things that he has asked me to do. I'm teaching. I'm sharing scripture from the gospel. Or when I pray to him. 
when things get tough or when things go good. No matter what happens, I'm always talking to him. And I feel that bond is getting stronger. The more I get things off my chest to him. And I know no matter what happens, I'm never going to be alone. And finally, as we read so much in here, Revelation 2.10, you know, be faithful unto death and we can receive the crown of life. These are plenty of assurances we've been given in the scripture. These are what we need to keep going. No matter how thick, hard things in life get, we know it's only temporary. So I gotta ask everybody, are you abiding in Christ? You know that like I said earlier, sometimes things in life get away. We've all struggled. We've all been in those places. But the more we abide in Him, the more that we lean on Him, we get that unbreakable bond with Him. And not only with Him. Have you ever felt stronger in your faith because you shared it with somebody else? And you all built that bond together? I know I have. And I felt stronger, a more of a bond with you all every single time I come here. The more that after something happens, maybe a class or maybe a lesson, you know, I get some feedback and some people talk to me about, you know, how that might have touched them or what I can do next time in order for it to be better. Those are the things I need. We can share that with other people. I promise you, no matter what happens in life, not only can we build that bond with each other, maybe we can touch the lives of somebody who's never came. Maybe we can touch someone who's never thought about abiding with Christ. Maybe we can show them what the Word says. Maybe that's all they need. Maybe all they needed was an example to look after. So if you're here tonight and maybe you haven't done a good job of it, or maybe you need help with something else. Or if you're ready to be baptized and haven't yet, and you're ready for your sins to be washed away, and you're ready to become a new creature, you can do that as well as we stand and sing the invitation song.